Good morning. I'm Darrell West, Vice President of Government Studies uh, here at the Brookings Institution, and I'd like to welcome you to this event on new advances in transportation and service delivery. So there are a number of new features in the transportation area. Autonomous vehicles are being tested in major cities. Ride-sharing services are becoming more prominent. Remote sensors are uh, gathering information on road conditions, traffic, and weather, as well as other things. And unmanned aerial systems are being deployed for firefighting, disaster relief, and law enforcement, among other areas. As an example, at the time of the Notre Dame Cathedral fire in Paris, drones helped firefighters locate the location of the fire and the intensity of the flames. And then that enabled them to uh, devise uh, certain strategies. And so uh, that was a way to uh, gather information at a time when people were not exactly uh, sure uh, what was happening. But at the same time that we have all these new developments, there are very important issues in terms of personal privacy, uh, human safety, legal liability, and uh, the kinds of regulations that we uh, need in order to uh, deal with these uh, types of uh, issues. It's a question in terms of how privacy can be maintained in the face of smart transportation features. How should federal and state agencies oversee these new uh, technologies? How should we think about some of these new uh, models uh, going forward? So to help us with these issues, we have three distinguished experts here with us today. So uh, Mark uh, Bartrick is Director of the Office of Aviation Services at the U.S. Department of the Interior. Uh, Darshan Devarkaran is a Program uh, Engineer in the North Carolina Department of Transportation. And Margaret Taylor is a Fellow in our Government Studies uh, Program at Bro Brookings and also a Senior Editor and Counsel at Lawfare. So, uh, Mark, I'd like to start with you. So, uh, tell us how the Department of Interior is using these uh, technologies, earlier you were telling us Interior manages over 500 million acres in the United States, uh, so that certainly is a major responsibility. What have your experiences uh, been? What's worked well? What hasn't worked well? Well, thanks, Gerald. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, for in Department of Interior, uh, with the, the vast responsibilities we have as a, the largest land steward in America uh, of your land, um, all public land, it's really been a game changer for us. And we see benefits in what we call the four S's. Uh, we're a science-based organization. Um, we manage your land based on the science that we uh, get from sensing. So we are able to get more persistent sensing with better resolution. We are able to take that, uh, that data and analyze it and be transparent about it because we've recorded it uh, through the use of unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, so we're better managing through better sensing. Uh, safety is our second S. We, uh, we aren't necessarily taking many pilots out of the cockpit, although we are removing some of them from some of our most dangerous missions, but we are reducing the risk for many of our employees on the ground who have uh, done a lot of these missions in traditional ways that are very dangerous, like inspecting dams by putting an engineer over the side uh, on a rope um, to inspect the dam. We don't have to do that anymore with drones. And then the uh, third one is uh, savings. Um, you know, our entire fleet of over 670 drones within the Department of the Interior costs less than uh, many of the single manned aircraft that, that we fly. Um, there's training uh, savings, there's maintenance savings. We've flown over 20,000 flights, and I think we've had 10 mechanical failures out of those 20,000 flights. They're very reliable. And we've saved uh, over $14 million last year alone on just operational savings by substituting small unmanned aircraft for those traditional methods. And then the final one is uh, service. Um, we get about 49% of the vote uh, about when we're going to go out and do our missions, whether that's fire, flood, volcano, um, or even migrations uh, and, you know, uh, checking on your land, search and rescue certainly. And so we're much more responsive when we can take that aircraft literally out of someone's backpack rather than going down to the airport and uh, scheduling a helicopter. So those are the, the four things that we've really seen a real game changer in our department. 
Okay, uh, thank you. So, uh, Darshan, you work in the North Carolina Department of Transportation, and I know over the weekend you were uh, busy with uh, the Hurricane uh, Dorian, and he was telling us earlier that uh, they uh, conducted uh, 50 uh, flights just to try and keep track of uh, possible uh, risks uh, right there. Uh, tell us uh, about uh, your experience and how uh, the state is thinking about uh, this topic. Sure. So as mentioned, uh, with the Hurricane Dorian, uh, luckily uh, nothing major happened. Uh, but uh, you know, with the Hurricane Florence uh, last year, we were well prepared with disaster response. Uh, we, uh, with Hurricane Florence, we had over 250 flight missions as conducted. And uh, it was the first time uh, where uh, it was organized, between, uh, you know, well organized, uh, where private and public sector worked together uh, with federal agencies uh, your traditional state agencies that are responding to disasters with no incidents, no accidents. So that was a great uh, a game changer for us was that uh, uh, we, we could work with uh, traditional agencies uh, that wouldn't uh, earlier uh, accept uh, the um, help provided to them. But when it comes to um, North Carolina DOT and North Carolina as such, we have a history uh, to, you know, uh, keep up with uh, with the Wright brothers. Uh, you know we have to continue that tradition of being first in everything. Uh, I hope no one from Ohio is here. Uh, we keep checking. If it is Actually, bad. I was born in Ohio. So. <laughs> Too bad. You know, if you have, uh, we can't change the history, but uh, we take the credit for everything uh, they did in North Carolina. And for us, the main thing is that uh, we would like to be first in everything uh, that's good. Uh, and uh, we started with first in uh, drone safety in uh, 2017, where we started integrating uh, safety training programs, workshops, uh, conferences that focused on educating our uh, agencies, our uh, public safety folks, uh, our uh, recreational pilots, everyone. Uh, even folks who are not interested in flying drones but would just like to know about drones, we started with that. But then we also moved towards being first in uh, uh, medical package delivery, which took place. Uh, the first test was done last year, but actually uh, right now the operations are uh, live, taking place every week uh, at Wakeman Hospital, uh, where uh, uh, Matanet and UPS have partnered together and able to do medical package delivery. The thing is, the whole uh, fact uh, is that Things are changing, uh, and it's changing at a fast pace. Uh, for North Carolina DOT, we are the number one DOT in the nation uh, for integrating drone technology because we do everything and anything that's related to drones. We don't focus just on infrastructure and uh, you know monitoring and inspection, but we do beyond that. We get into research where we have worked with agencies uh, like State High Patrol on crash scene reconstruction. We are going to underwater vegetation mapping um, with environmental folks disaster response, package delivery, uh, even uh, you know, uh, working with our recreational pilots to find spaces to fly. Altogether, our role uh, has been uh, not just uh, you know, a focus within the state, but it's been a national thing. Uh, we have become a um, national leader in education and outreach, uh, and we hope to continue that tradition uh, with this technology moving forward. Okay, uh, so Margaret, we've heard a little bit about the details at the state and federal levels in terms of how particular agencies are uh, using uh, some of these new models. Uh, how do you see the policy and regulatory issues in uh, this space? What should we be worried about? How should we be thinking about these topics? So I think, if, 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 you, if I may, start with a little bit of sort of illustrative examples of interesting things that people are using drones for, because I think it kind of shows rather than tells what some of the challenges are. Um, so let me just go through a few. I think these are really interesting and fascinating. Um, you know, when we think of drones in the commercial space, you know, I think probably all of us are thinking delivery. You know, Amazon is working obviously on, on these programs. You can imagine a drone delivering things in urban areas to, your, to, to homes, delivering to remote rural areas. Very exciting, um, very efficient, presumably. Uh, so that's an interesting space. Um, so I'm going to go through each of the interesting applications and then come back to each to some of them and, and explain some of the risks. Um, so agriculture, lots of potential in the agriculture space. Uh, there are these really cool uh, predator birds called roe birds that can be deployed across uh, a field, scaring away bird, other birds that, that eat the crops so you can preserve more of, more of your crops. 
uh, precision, precision agriculture, you know, drone swarms that can tell a farmer, you know, exactly what's going on in his fields very efficiently. Um, location drones, I, this is a really interesting one, that can track specific animals in a herd. So like use facial recognition software on a cow, a particular cow that might be sick or that can come in and, and for example, diagnose a sick cow. So you can imagine just all these really interesting things that could make farming and agriculture more efficient. Uh, fighting a wildfire, which was refer referred to earlier, flying a drone over a wildfire can yield really valuable information for firefighters about where the fire is, where it's going, how to stop it. Uh, law enforcement, uh, surveillance applications. I read a statistic that three out of four public safety agencies say they are already operating drones or working on implementing a drone program to assist in their uh, law enforcement efforts. So you know, better, better tools for them. This has already been discussed briefly, improvements in emergency response, healthcare and medical applications. Um, and just the last one, climate related. I think these are really fascinating. Uh, you, you can go on YouTube and see uh, drones being flown over, you know, beautiful mountains and glaciers. And you can just imagine it's being done using those drones to, you know, monitor uh, climate change, to see what's going on with glaciers in remote areas where currently it's very difficult to get to. Um, other, other things, you know, dr using drones to generate electricity from high altitude winds using something called a box wing drone. That's sort of in development. So all these interesting things, uh, lots of possibility. Private industry is just pursuing this and is really uh, being very inventive. Uh, but as we all know, there are risks associated with these things. And when there are risks associated with, for example, public safety, um, that's where regulation uh, comes in. That's where policy comes in. Um, and I'll just go through. So deliver, back to delivery systems. Um, back in May in Switzerland, a 22-pound Swiss Post drone crashed about 50 yards away from a group of children. Uh, that drone program was suspended at that, at that time. Uh, and these, these questions are really tactile uh, because what happened with that drone, as I understand it, is that the, the parachute that deployed once the drone was falling out of the sky actually shredded. And so the questions you know, they're asking themselves, and lots of jurisdictions are asking themselves, are what, what are exactly the right safety standards, you know, does, do we need a backup parachute, uh, you know, two ropes instead of one, like how does it, how is it gonna work exactly? To, because when you have a drone cra crash near a bunch of children, that gets people, you know, scared uh, and, and engaged and uh, against the technology. Um, also in the delivery system, you know, fears, we talked about this earlier, fears of jobs going away. Uh, right now, Amazon, you know, the, there's a guy who drives a truck and he pulls up in front of your house and he brings a package right up. So, you know, what's, what's that guy going to do? Is he going to, you know, about now be a drone operator? Like, what's going to happen? Is he going to be trained to do that? Uh, law enforcement, and I think we'll, we'll get into more of this, Daryl, but you have to balance civil li liberties, obviously. Uh, privacy concerns. Citizens are going to wonder what the, what the police are doing with the information that is being collected as it flies over, <clears throat> uh, for example, a protest, um, taking pictures of, of everyone who's engaged in the protest. Uh, there also needs to be deconfliction with manned aircraft, uh, the avionics of manned aircraft when you use drones. Firefighting, it's better firefighting. Uh, when an unauthorized drone enters a wildfire space, so like a, a, somebody either with malicious intent or just a clueless person who's like, oh, I'm gonna fly my drone and there's a wildfire nearby. That means all of the, uh, the helicopters and planes that are fighting the fire have to then be grounded. So you have to deal with the unauthorized uh, UAS that might be coming into that system. And finally, climate, back to climate. Um, I just heard this a, a couple of days ago, some climate activists, activists in near Heathrow Airport, it's called Heathrow Pause. I guess Heathrow is adding another um, runway. And some climate activists are planning to use commercial drones to fly them into the no-fly the no five kilometer zone to protest the addition of that runway uh, to highlight the impact of air travel on the environment. And that's scheduled to begin on September 13th. Uh, unclear how long it will last. Probably those operators of those drones will be arrested. They're actually asking for drone operators to volunteer to come in and operate the drones as people get arrested so that more can, can backfill. So, you know, 
this is a this is a complicated space. There's there's uh, upside and there's downside too, and the risks need to be sort of uh, dealt with, um, and that takes the the regulatory regime. But I would say, Daryl, and then I'll conclude my my comments here. You know, this technology. I'm a, I'm a governance person. I'm not really like a drone person per se. Um, this technology. It, it is just a new technology, and all of the tools that we usually use to regulate and you know, infuse these technologies with our values, um, it, it's the same process and the same um, types of considerations for, for, any, for any, uh, any technology. So I don't see this as a, like a brand new sort of sui generis space. Um, we, we should be using the tools that we have in the policy regulatory space to, to mitigate risks to people and also promote, promote the benefits. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so Mark, Margaret has raised a number of policy and regulatory issues, privacy, surveillance, uh, human safety uh, with law enforcement. Like how long should the data collected through uh, unmanned systems actually uh, be stored? How is Interior thinking about these issues? And uh, by the way, we did try and get uh, a representative from the FAA, which is uh, the, the major agency in this area, to speak on the panel, but uh, we're not able to, uh, we're not successful in uh, doing that. Uh, are there changes the FAA needs to make in response to some of these policy and regulatory issues? So I think, uh, to start with the first part of your question, what are, we, what are we doing? The good news is, as Margaret said, these are aircraft. By, by definition, they are aircraft. And, uh, thanks to the great state of Ohio and North Carolina, we've had aircraft for over 100 years now. So we're getting pretty good at how to operate these things. Um, and, uh, and I say that when it comes not only to safety, but, but also to privacy and being a nuisance, you know, whether that's noise or you know, just buzzing people. You know, we, have, we already have uh, laws against that kind of stuff. And, and the other good thing is we've had law enforcement and law enforcement done from the air for as long as we've had, uh, pretty much as long as we've had aircraft. So all of those policy decisions about you know, what you can take from the air in terms of imagery and sensing and how long you can keep that, they, um, thankfully has already been handled by law enforcement professionals and policy professionals, and so we didn't have to reinvent that. Um, it was reiterated in 2015 with a presidential memo on privacy and transparency that President Obama signed, and all the agencies that uh, are operating drones, Interior being one of those, uh, has a privacy impact assessment. Uh, you go on our website, which we're very proud, is chock full of information. And, and you can see how we use the drones and how long we keep the, uh, the data and how we keep that data, uh, depending on you know, what, we're, uh, what we're taking. You know, the one thing we have been very uh, keen about in our program is to emphasize that um, you know, the data is currency. And just because you have an object you're trying to take an image of, you're probably taking imagery of, of other things. And so our, our biggest um, thing that we've done in privacy is we've, we train all of our operators, all of our program managers to talk to the public before you launch. Because if you tell people what you're going to do, um, you know, and you're probably not going to tell them you're doing a, an active law enforcement operation. But you're doing a search and rescue. You're doing a habitat survey, wildfire. You tell them you're out there doing that. They're always very appreciative. And the one question they ask is, hey, can we see the video? It's probably pretty cool. And then once you do that, they're, they're, they put their imaginations to bed and it's all good. So I think it's really just a lot of common sense, uh, both on the safety and the privacy side. Uh, Darshan, I'll put the same question to you. At, at the federal level, uh, what types of uh, new policies and or new regulations do we need to consider? And then secondly, because you're operating at the state level, what about the differing jurisdictions of state versus federal agencies? How, how is that working out and uh, are there changes we need to make there? So, um, you know, as Mark pointed out on the privacy issue, yes, there is uh, the whole concern on who's using and uh, what's the data coming out of it. But when it comes to uh, state agencies, I would say that uh, uh, for us, uh, you know, it's not the, uh, it's not FAA, uh, you know, uh, slowing the progress down technically. It's more states are themselves slowing the, pro pro uh, the progress. Uh, there are some states who are ready to move ahead faster, but there are some states who are still figuring out, uh, you know, who is going to lead a drone program within the state, who's going to do what in the state. You know, I've talked to states where they are having a basic issue of like, uh, I, you know, I would say like half of the DOTs out there are still figuring out who should be the U.S. champion within their agency. 
And uh, you know, when we are trying to move this technology further, uh, you know, in a faster pace, uh, you, if you take uh, manned aviation, which has taken over 100 years to, and it's still trying to perfect the whole model, uh, you have unmanned systems that you are expecting within five years to uh, keep up with manned aviation. And the reality is that's not possible. Uh, and the only way to do that for state agencies uh, is to work with the federal agencies to see how uh, you know data can be shared to them. How um, uh, you know with the uh, integration pilot program, uh, the FAS uh, US integration pilot program, there was a great opportunity for state and local government agencies to work with uh, tribal government and everyone to work with FA to help. Uh, you know, there's three uh, main focus was. Uh, one was uh, how state and local government agencies, tribal government agencies can uh, regulate the airspace uh, below 400 feet, uh, can help regulate. And then second was how do we bring in new innovation and technology, not just within uh, United States, but outside uh, companies to come together. Uh, and third was how does this uh, also help in the economic development benefit for the states and for United States overall. All this really, uh, you know, it is like one and a half, it's about two years into it. And there's a lot of success coming out of it, which you know, which was not uh, you know two years back. You wouldn't see this. Uh, and when we were sitting on the other side of the table, we felt that regulations were restricting. Uh, it's not the to get regulations in place. Uh, FA needs data, and the only way for FA to get data is where pr public private sector work together and provide the data. And for a state like ours, uh, you know, North Carolina. Uh, Many of the folks who are sitting down here are partners with us, and they have uh, worked with us to make this successful. The success of a program is also the success of the industry and the people working with it. So when we are sharing this data, FA is ready to work creating new regulations. Um, so the part 135 came out of all this. How did this, uh, you know, before getting into the integration pilot program, no one even thought about 135 operations. Uh, and 135 operations always existed in the man side. Could you explain what uh, 135 yeah. operations The 135 are? operations, uh, so in the manned aviation side, you have uh, your air ca carriers that tra uh, transport people, uh, you know, your airlines and everything, and then you have package delivery and cargo delivery. Those are your 135 operators. And how they operate is way different, uh, you know, uh, from uh, commercial uh, air carriers and everything. So there are certain, re uh, you know, uh, regulations around it, uh, you know, which could be like, Pages, uh, maybe as you know, multiple uh, pa uh, pages. And when it comes to unmanned side, they realize that uh, your part one part one hundred seven operation, that's your FA part one hundred seven license, is not enough for package delivery. So they came up, said that part one thirty five operations. Now, part one thirty five operations is not something which uh, we can just give a sheet of paper and say you need to uh, X mark all these things and give us everything. FA is figuring out what for manned aviation might have been thousands of pages, how does it become 100 pages or less for the unmanned systems uh, side? So how do, so we are working, uh, not just us, but other uh, nine uh, uh, states are also working with FAA to see where, uh, what is required, uh, you know, things like airworthiness for aircrafts, training standards for aircrafts, all these things are coming into practice so that after this, any and every company is able to, uh, you know, uh, replicate this process. And FAA, uh, you know, can change the regulations wherein, uh, say, two, three years from now, package delivery is no more a, uh, a dream. It's a reality. Like night operations. First, it used to be like it's difficult to get night operations. Now, night operations are more easier to get. So these are the things where we are seeing the change is taking place. But it's also us as such that are restricting this progress. And that is where the regulations as such cannot be changed just because of a specific need of one uh, company or a state, it has to be a mutual understanding between all the states that this is the progress towards the right direction. So Margaret, I'd like to like you to, ask, uh, to answer your own questions about uh, the need for new policies and regulations. How should we address privacy? How should we protect privacy? How do we uh, promote human safety? On law enforcement, how long should law enforcement store data that they collect via drones? I, you are very interested in that question, and I'm not sure I have a specific answer for you. I think 180 days is the incidental collection sort of time period, so that's how long uh, law enforcement generally would 
uh, keep incidental collection information and sort of get rid of it. So um, that, that, I think, as, as Mark said, has been sort of a feature of, of law enforcement generally. Um, so I, I, maybe the best way to answer the question is to sort of talk about how I see the phases of these types of regulations and policies going. I, I think um, the sort of phase one was back in 2015 uh, when the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy were given sort of legal authorities to sort of protect their own, uh, their own stuff. Um, obviously, that doesn't speak to all of these innovations in the, the commercial space. Uh, phase two, uh, on, the reg on the sort of legal side and is currently being implemented, I, I think of as being sort of a 2018. There was a, uh, a law, the Federal Aviation uh, Reauthorization Act included a whole big section on UAS, on drones, uh, including um, a particular section called the Preventing Emerging Threats Act. Um, and what that did was give the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice enhanced legal authorities to, on the law enforcement side, um, and among other things. Uh, and you know, before that, it was not clear that there were adequate federal sort of uh, penalties for something like an unauthorized operation of a drone. Uh, and it just as an example, uh, it is being put into practice. On September 3rd, the US attorney in Philadelphia announced uh, charges against a Bangor, Pennsylvania uh, per, uh, person in Pennsylvania. He, he was charged with a number of offenses, but one of them was knowingly operating an aircraft when not registered. Uh, he had a DJI model Phantom 3, which is a, a, you know, a drone you can just buy, seven improvised explosive devices and 10 firearms. And the quote from the US attorney was, it does not take much imagination to conjure up the enormous harm that can result from the combination of illegal firearms, explosives, and drone aircraft. So they're all levels of law enforcement were sort of involved in this, in this action. So I think it's, it's showing how a law that was passed can actually be put into practice to get, um, again, the normal sort of, we think of as governance laws, regulatory system going in this space uh, to deter people from, you know, weaponizing a drone and flying it and terrorizing their neighbors. Um, the future, which I think of as phase three, uh, the future is figuring out, from a public safety perspective, I think is figuring out, and this is, this is the, the next big space, and we've talked a little bit about this, is putting in the right uh, law enforcement and regulatory framework so that state and local entities can also have the authorities that they need to protect uh, the public. I think that is an underdeveloped space, um, but I know, and a lot of it has to do with these issues. They're all about privacy, thinking through that, um, what is the right for each community. So this is like the, the next phase. And just to be very specific, I think, you know, to protect the public going forward, state and local law enforcement are gonna need three things. They're gonna need remote identification uh, so they can actually identify when there's a, a, a drone that's a threat. Um, UAS traffic management, so you know, understanding what's going on in the in the space. And then the third thing would be the counter UAS. So this is the um, you know how do you, how if there is a drone that is a threat, there's for example like gonna hit critical infrastructure or something. What what can state and local law enforcement entities do to actually sort of like pull it out of the sky? Uh, and that is, answering that question is a combination of technological developments that I think need to be uh, encouraged, but also uh, the, the, in the regulatory space, like making sure it's done right. Uh, Mark, I'm wondering if it's time uh, that we should rethink how we think about uh, airspace. So, you know, when you, and I know both the gentlemen on our uh, panels, uh, on the panel are uh, pilots. So, uh, you know, other than landings and takeoffs, uh, most pilots are operating above 1,000 uh, feet. Uh, when we're thinking about drones and unmanned uh, systems, and certainly at the hobbyist uh, level, we're thinking about activities under 400 feet. And so right now, there's a lot of regulation uh, at the pilot level, uh, not so much a regulation uh, at the lower levels, but should we start to rethink how we think about the airspace so that 
you know, the levels are starting to mix a little bit. Uh, drones are developing better capabilities. It used to be there was a line of sight requirement that as long as the operator, uh, the drone was within the line of sight of the operator, uh, there were a few restrictions. But of course, drones now can, uh, you know, stay in the air for an hour. They can go five to 10 miles, so they're going well beyond the line of uh, sight. Uh, so how should we think about uh, regulations in uh, those areas? And then also, what about no-fly zones? Like there's some areas around airports, clearly we don't want uh, drone activity uh, there. Uh, how broadly should we uh, think about no-fly zones? Uh, well, Darrell, I think another, um, and look at the airspace, I, I kind of look to where we've been. You know, when we uh, first fielded aircraft, um, and as they continued to uh, improve and we in technology and uh, in in the markets that they served we designed the airspace to fit those markets and the technology that was available uh, and if you look at the the unmanned aircraft space we have a completely new class of aircraft so we have we have great new technologies and we have new markets and as you said the, uh, as, as a Navy pilot I, I rarely flew below a thousand feet unless I was on the training mission, uh, specific low-level training mission, or taking off or landing, you know, transitory through that. Um, that airspace that we're currently flying all these drones in, no one ever cared about. And evidence of that is we don't monitor that space. And, and UTM is such a big issue because we didn't do anything down there. So I think we have, and it's, it's somewhat of a fleeting opportunity because we're, uh, no one is talking about doing this. We have a, an opportunity, a blank canvas, if you will, to, to design this space. And, and uh, you know, our state partners and local partners, I think there are, you know, uh, opportunities for them to be involved. Uh, local governments um, permit folks to put scaffolding up and do inspections on buildings, to paint buildings, do window washing. I think that that same thing could apply to drones doing those missions because if, if I'm an airplane pilot and I'm flying that close to a building, I got bigger problems than your drone. Um, and so I think that there, there are things that we should do there, um, and, and uh, especially when you're thinking about, you know, we're talking about small and mid aircraft, we're talking about larger ones, talk about urban air mobility in the future. Um, you know, now is the time to design that airspace thinking forward uh, rather than all of a sudden we get all this in place and now where are we going to put all this stuff? Um, so I think that's, uh, that's an opportunity we, we need to take advantage of. Okay, Darshan, I'll put the same question to you and maybe also add the package delivery uh, component uh, to it because that uh, is an area that's likely to grow. Sure. So, so I would say that, um, you know, a few things to think about is, first of all, the word no-fly zone, uh, it's pretty confusing. Like, you know, even in the manned aviation side, you have different airspaces, you have restricted airspace and all, but all have certain criteria. So, you know, you would call uh, certain areas like airports as responsible fly zones uh, because, you know, when it comes to flying at airports, there's two things. One is flying actually in the airport. Airport inspections, drones are being utilized, can benefit drones, you know, can benefit mm -hmm. airports, uh, mass, uh, you know, big airports, small airports alike. You know, small airports, you have limited staff uh, and limited staff, uh, as a result, you can only do limited checks. Uh, and Drones can, you know, be integrated into uh, those smaller airports to do inspections of runway, inspections of uh, uh, wildlife, uh, night inspection, day inspection. Now that's flying within the airport. Uh, now you have uh, operations around the airport that could be your infrastructure, uh, like uh, rail. You have roads that need to be monitored. Now all these are traditionally road, mo uh, you know, infrastructure monitoring that is done in the man side, like bridge inspections and all. Uh, which is traditionally done in the, uh, you know, they do not go through airport authorization to get the work done. And these areas are pretty much, there are areas closer to the airport where this is where there has to be a whole, uh, you know, understanding of what's exactly a no-fly zone, like critical infrastructure, you know, power plants and all those things. You can understand those are no-fly zones. Others are responsible flying zones where you have certain restrictions, but certain authorities have that uh, permission or, uh, uh, you know, are granted access based on certain conditions. Like, it's not your Part 107 that's going to really change anything. It's going to be the future regulations that's going to come in. Like, your Part 107, and I was, we were talking some time back earlier, is like your student pilot license. 
all it gives you access is that, okay, someday you might become a pilot but it does not really give you, uh, it's not going to guarantee you that you're going to become a private pilot, instrument pilot, commercial pilot, nothing. It's just a student pilot license that you're part of the training, you're going to do this. Then you have to go through a set amount of process to become an expert. Now, a private pilot cannot fly into clouds, uh, cannot fly in the night. Now, these things are defined in the man side, but when it comes to part 107, you have your part 107, you can do anything, no. That's the changes that need to come. Before the airspace, uh, before even we hit the airspace area, it's understanding what your license is valid for. You have to have extra amount of training to operate infrastructure areas, airports. Then it comes to package delivery. You already have 135 operation. Now, what does that 135 operation entails? Is that you can fly packages. Uh, but when it comes to questions like uh, crossing a road, cro uh, if the road is maintained by the state, who has the right to permit that crossing taking place. So those type of things are a concern when it comes to package deliveries. Uh, it's, uh, you'll be crossing roads, you'll be crossing over people, you're gonna be uh, crossing over infrastructure that could be critical infrastructure or just you know, state-owned infrastructure. Who has the right? And that is still a debate that if it, uh, traditionally anything takes off from there is under FAA's jurisdiction. But through the, uh, you know, the integration pilot program, uh, we, were, we are trying, which is still a process, not like we are close to finding a solution to it. It's still trying to identify that, and when it comes to FA, they have asked us uh, to provide data to prove that uh, crossing roads is a safe thing when it comes to package delivery. So you have your drone, you have parachute on it, you have uh, experts uh, that are trained hours on it, you have packages that are like, medical packages that go through the whole permission. You know, you have a whole different permission to use anything uh, beyond just water and stuff. You have to go through all the authority. You have everything. Now comes the big obstacle is you can't fly over a road. So how does that happen? And that, change, that is the changes that need to be made is who has the authority after a certain altitude. And if you're actually flying over a person's property, does he have the right? Does the state have the right? That authority, once we figure that out, then we can start hitting the airspaces and say, okay, up to 400 feet, 100 feet is this, 200 feet is that, you have responsible fly zones, you have restrictive fly zones. That's where uh, we have to still work towards, and that is where the problem is, is that uh, urban air mobility and stuff, it's, uh, you know, tw 2015, we talked about drones. 2020, we're saying, now you're gonna be having urban air mobility. 2025, what, what is the next? It's, it's moving too fast. And people really don't have that, uh, you know, w people are lacking patience <laughs> to work with, uh, you know, agencies that are, you know, you have to understand that these are traditional agencies that are seeing new technology. They're not going to be like, yes, tomorrow you can get anything and everything that's done. You need to have the patience to move forward with them. So Margaret Darshan has raised some interesting questions in terms of who has authority, who should have authority, uh, who should have the right to decide uh, these uh, complex uh, questions. And then also, I'm just uh, curious, given the overlapping jurisdictions and the lack of clarity on some of the rules, how do we think about issues of legal liability when harms take place? So that is a very good question. Um, and, you know, I, I think, again, my, my answer would be we, we go to our traditional tools for how we think about legal liability. Um, and I think those tools will work pretty well. The questions that I have going forward, though, um, relate to, for example, automation. Uh, when you have automation, you know, I, and I think this is a, a space that is, needs to be developed uh, um, from a regulation perspective, from a, from a laws perspective. Um, it, I think there's a lot of lack of clarity there. Add in um, something like artificial intelligence, which uh, is another one of these technologies which is com also coming down the pike and will be integrated, um, I'm sure, at some point uh, with UAS, um, other technologies, for example, 5G. Uh, you know, when you, you're integrating all these technologies together and you have artificial intelligence, um, there are some really, really, really tricky questions, I think, that are gonna be coming um, down the pike, 
Um, I'm not sure as I sit here that I have the, the answer to those questions, um, but those are Actually, the... if you did, you probably wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, but, I mean, you're right. Like, these are the questions that need to be addressed, and I agree the technology is just developing at a much faster pace than uh, our ability from a governance perspective to think through these issues and implement them. And again, as I said before, like infuse our values, uh, our, our ideas of liability um, into, these, into these technologies so that the, the right people can be held accountable. So it's probably not a satisfying answer for you, Daryl. Um, if, I, if I did have the, the, when I do have the answers, I will get back to you on that. How's that? Okay. Invited <laughs> for the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, one last uh, uh, question for the panel, then we can open the floor to uh, questions and comments uh, from the audience. And that concerns the need for infrastructure investment. So we're talking about a lot of different aspects of transportation changing. Autonomous vehicles, the ride-sharing services, the use of remote sensors, uh, unmanned systems that we've been uh, talking about. How are uh, both state governments as well as uh, federal agencies thinking about infrastructure? Do we need new designs uh, in terms of how we think about urban areas? Uh, how are you thinking about that, Mark? Uh, again, Daryl, I think the first part of the infrastructure is the, the airspace, and um, you know I'm, I'm concerned we're not taking advantage of the opportunity to, to look at the airspace, particularly the below 400 feet airspace, and, and see what we can do with that to uh, maximize safety as well as the opportunity for, uh, for drones. Um, as a user, largest non-military drone program and the world, I think, so far, I'm concerned about, uh, you know, the, the ability to uh, get performance, scalability, and cost. Um, and so when I hear about uh, infrastructure like UTM, I keep asking, who's, who's going to pay for that? As a pilot who, uh, even at 30,000 feet, has gone and lost radar contact in clear air, I worry about the you know, uh, and lost a lot of cell phone calls uh, down low, uh, how, that's, how well that's gonna work um, and whether we need to invest that infrastructure. Um, Beyond Visual Line of Sight is the best. Everyone wants that. Um, but I look at, you know, uh, best is the enemy of better and better is the enemy of good enough. And I'll tell you, we found that Visual Line of Sight, hey, you get done, you walk, you drive to another spot, you do more Visual Line of Sight, is, is good enough, and it's a lot better than what we had before drones, which was nothing. And so I worry about uh, that we're going to over-regulate and over-equip uh, drones that don't ever need to fly beyond visual line of sight. And, and I see some of that infrastructure being placed on here because of uh, fear, uh, security, and, uh, and safety fear. Um, you know, I, I was at a Nationals game last year, and uh, the guy came over the loudspeaker and said, everybody, please get up and go to the concourse. It was a beautiful day. I don't know what was going on. We got to the concourse, and then after we got our beers, we figured out that there was lightning within 10 miles. And so that was a non-material solution to a threat. And so why we can't do that for some drone threats instead of you know, putting lasers and guns and all sorts of stuff? And, and have we really thought through you know, that's great infrastructure, but have we thought through the consequences when we shoot down that drone on the, the mall and it falls on a D-Day survivor? And it was a 10-year-old kid who didn't know the rules. So I think there's a lot of stuff uh, that we have to think about uh, in terms of policy, in terms of investment before we make that. Uh, we might uh, end up with a lot of stuff we, we don't really want. Darshan, your thoughts on infrastructure investment? So Infrastructure is what we do, you know, that's what our role is, uh, Department of Transportation, uh, we maintain all the infrastructure in, uh, in our state and all the other DOTs do respectively in their states. Uh, for us, uh, you know, uh, this, there may be more models, but I believe there's two models to this. One is to build heliports, uh, you know, drone ports or all these things. That's one model people have been saying is we need to build this uh, over buildings, over certain areas and, uh, you know, uh, get prepared for the future of urban air mobility. But I also feel like uh, coming from the manned aviation side, uh, you know, for example, North Carolina has 72 public airports. Not all of them are utilized. Uh, you have barely like uh, one flight or two flights uh, taking off from certain, uh, some of these airports. 
uh, which uh, you know some do not even have a, a flights taking off a couple of days. And if you have infrastructure already built in these airports, uh, why would you want to build a whole different area? Uh, you would want to utilize the uh, the available resources first. So you know, uh, like when we uh, uh, this is also when it was my, during my student pilot days uh, when I used to be flying. Uh, this was in Florida. Uh, you know, we used to go from airport to airport uh, looking for cheap fuel uh, <laughs> because we have to build those 100 hours. And uh, you go to certain airports and there's nothing. But they have a brand new building, they have a brand new tower, uh, you know, they have a tower, but there's nothing around. There's so much space there. Uh, if you can utilize those space to create the future, that's great. Uh, if that space runs out, then utilize the next space available. Uh, but, you know, preparing, you know, investing uh, in something that is future and putting so much money towards it right now and not sure when, how, when this is going to be a reality. Is it going to be, uh, to, uh, initially it used to be 2020 was the uh, date that people talked about. Now uh, that's looking like 2025, maybe 2030. Uh, we have a committee created within the uh, DOD called Beyond Surface Transportation. That's a 2030 vision. So we have already thought about 2030. Uh, so we have skipped 2025 <laughs> out of our uh, range. But uh, for this, this is something where industry, uh, this is basically something where it's going to be a tradition, uh, not the traditional approach. You're going to have in industries investing. You'll have state investing and maybe uh, using federal land and federal uh, areas, also state areas. So uh, for the success of this, uh, it has to be uh, from all sides, uh, but like uh, as Mark mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, counter U.S. technology and uh, you know, setting up systems like that and all. Uh, it's it's something which uh, people have taken it out of proportion right now. Uh, everyone, uh, you know, everyone wanted a drone. Now everyone wants a counter U.S. technology, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, we get calls from uh, uh, us being the hotline for all unmanned systems problems. In, within the state, we get calls like, uh, like police departments calling us and saying, uh, uh, well, in the, in the shooting range where our folks are practicing, uh, somebody's flying a drone, uh, their two solution is either shoot it down, or second thing is uh, uh, they wanted to buy a counter US technology. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, you know, it's, you, you can go and buy. There are very good products out there, but you have to understand uh, the rules around it. Um, People, you know, companies that have created drones have also created a solution to, uh, uh, you know, mitigate it. You have to, be, uh, you have to uh, see that. So I think altogether it is like uh, when it comes to in, uh, putting in money towards this technology is also seeing what traditional uh, resources we have. First use that and then move to the next step. Okay, Margaret, your thoughts on uh, infrastructure, then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, I guess I would just note for the audience that there are uh, a couple of Notice of proposed rulemakings out on, for example, UAS flight restrictions near critical infrastructure facilities. Actually, this one's scheduled to come out this year. So there are opportunities for people to provide, uh, you know, their comments, their thoughts, their views on uh, these issues and how these types of things can be done better. So I would just would encourage, again, governance, I'm a governance person, encourage everyone to, you know, raise your voice on these issues, get interested, and get educated. Um, there are opportunities for just normal Americans to have input on these issues uh, at both the federal and the state levels. Okay, uh, let's open the floor to uh, questions or comments or microphones coming up. There's a gentleman right here on the aisle. And if you can give us your uh, name and organization, please. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Gary Loberg, Mammal Adventures. Uh, as somebody who spent most of my flying career below 1,000 feet, um, two, two comments I'd like to make. One, uh, the assumption in the conversation when we talk UASs here is these were all rotary wing UASs, right? We did not mention fixed wing at all. But my point is is that uh, specificity, specificity in language, particularly as you write those FARs, is going to be important. The second part is that below 1,000, as I mentioned, is not unoccupied, right? And the pilot workload at 500 and below is... Well, let, let's say considerable. Your time for response is different. Um, when your margins, if you're recommending 400 and below for unmanned systems flying all over the place, one person blinks 
and you wind up having uh, two different airplanes with spinning parts in close proximity to one another. So as you write, as you propose policy or language, um, finding a way, whether it's uh, augmented, you know, crash avoidance systems or, or something else, that's got to be part of the solution set um, because I spent a lot of time with the, the big sky little bullet, and that's <laughs> not always a recipe for success. Comments from our panel? Totally agree with that. And, uh, you know, below 1,000 feet, uh, uh, and this is where it uh, comes back to its package delivery. When you're uh, doing it below 1,000 feet, uh, you have your, um, uh, so take an example, medical delivery between hospitals. You have your uh, medivac helicopters. You have your uh, military helicopters that hardly look at notums. They just fly. And then you have uh, your crop dusters. Again, in a t city, you're not going to see a crop duster just flying on top of this thing, but you have, uh, you know, uh, 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 diving operations that takes place. You have a lot of stuff that is going on below 1,000 feet. And the thing is, when it comes to uh, fixed wing rotor wing, that's a whole different uh, ball game there. It's rotor wings, you know, have the po potential to be more restricted in, uh, you know, where they operate. You can control it, but while it comes to uh, fixed wings, uh, it has needs more space. Uh, then you have the uh, between them the uh, you know the hybrid between both of that which has the capability of a rotor wing and this thing so you have different technology different understanding it's but it comes back to is uh, yes we can regulate airspace at 400 feet but people then want 500 feet then they want 600 feet they want 700 they just you know it's become like uh, the question earlier was about uh, when does data you know how, how long do you store data we have become data ho holders basically we just don't know when to delete anything <laughs> And then same way when it comes to airspace, uh, we have 400 feet restriction, but uh, there are over 50 percent people who still want to fly over, over 400 feet just because there's a restriction. They're like, yep, 400, 450 feet, uh, I've done it, that's not a big deal. I'm like, okay, you didn't talk to me about it, but that's the thing. It's, we, can, we are thinking about um, you know, regulating 400 feet, we may be thinking about regulating 1,000, uh, uh, but it keeps piling up. You, you, it has to come, uh, changes have to come within regulation, but also the operators. You know, it's loud. That's why I say the part 107 is not enough. It's a start. Uh, once you get more professional people, and, as, uh, and something else Margaret pointed out was when you do package delivery, uh, the post traditional package delivery, the driver stops and he comes and drops the packages or he has additional help. Will he become a drone pilot? Yes, that's how it is going to be. Uh, when com before computers came in, uh, you would uh, you trained the people who were uh, in that role to learn how uh, computers were used. But then the future people you hired were people who understood how to operate a computer. So it is that step by step process where regulations have to go, and also uh, training has to be integrated. Uh, back there, uh, along the wall, there's a microphone coming over to you. Hi there. Um, name's Gavin. I'm an intern and student here at Brookings in the Governance Policy Department. And my question is for the panel uh, concerning uh, will the president's recent disclosure of surveillance imagery in August on Twitter have a positive or negative effect on the interest in creating in novel and innovative policy for drone regulations and investment? All right, that's your question. <laughs> so um, great question. Thank you. Um, so uh, my, part of my background, I was, uh, I was a Navy pilot for 25 years, and I got to be the drone for part of those missions. I flew photo reconnaissance and found out people don't like when you fly over the country taking pictures. They'll shoot at you or they'll move the stuff out of the way so you can't take pictures. So for me, uh, security is, is, a, is a big deal. I think security needs to be um, part of every program. Uh, and in our program, it was in from the very beginning. We set requirements. Um, encrypted control link, encrypted payload link, the ability for us to deny or lock out uh, any information sharing. Uh, and, and we worked with uh, companies. We worked with one particular company to develop a solution to that uh, because they didn't meet that requirement. And, uh, and I think that the conversation right now is kind of on, on security, as I see it in the press, is kind of bifurcated. There's, 
there's a genuine concern for security, which I agree with. Um, but security comes from good requirements, not from geography. Uh, I am probably one of many recipients in this room of free credit monitoring, thanks to uh, my personal information being uh, compromised on a uh, server within the government. Um, so location didn't help me there. Um, I think the other issue is, uh, is a realization, because these drones are very visible, that um, we don't make a lot of electronics. Maybe we don't make any electronics in the United States anymore. Um, I'm going to buy a Zenith TV lately. You know, so I think there's two conversations that, that need to go on, and I'm concerned that they're both happening at the same time, and that uh, you know, banning products never generated uh, the U.S. industry. You know, banning Japanese cars in the 70s never would have uh, kick-started the U.S. auto industry. And, and frankly, it's not going to solve the security issue. What's going to solve the security issue is good requirements, uh, both in industry and government, and then adhering to those requirements and only buying products that uh, meet those requirements. So thanks for your question. And just to add to that, you know, if you start banning the technologies, uh, for example, if you ban, uh, you know, by, based on geography, you, uh, you're going to, like, for public safety agencies, 95% of the agencies are not going to be able to use drones right. because you don't have a technology that can help them uh, in that price point that uh, you know, comfort uh, level of uh, training, there's a lot of those things that has to be understood. Banning is not the solution, it's working with the companies, working, finding a solution to it. Uh, if there is a problem, uh, there can, is a solution to it. And if the solution can be met together, that's easier for all the agencies to work with. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. There's a gentleman right there on the aisle near the back. There's a microphone coming up behind you. If you can give us your name and organization, please. Yeah, Peter Lewis, I'm with uh, Precision Hawk, and we're on the uh, National Aerospace System Integration Support Contract for the FAA. Uh, what I work on primarily as a systems engineer uh, is counter uh, UAS. Uh, Darshan, one of the things that you had mentioned uh, when it came to shooting drones out of the sky, uh, I just want to assure everyone that that's not going to be the only uh, methodology of uh, arresting Absolutely. a drone, but it's going to happen. So. Uh, at the FAA, we have three primary concerns. The first one is keeping drones from interfering with manned aircraft. Uh, that's the worst thing that could happen is a drone bringing down a manned aircraft. Uh, we saw what happened to Captain Sullenberg with just seagulls bringing that Boeing 757 down. So a drone would really do an efficient job on a fan jet engine. Secondly, we want to keep drones away from people. And thirdly, away from each other. So in that process... Uh, and I'll just use the placeholder name right now of one, which is local uh, UAS or unmanned aircraft system network. Uh, that's where Verizon and the other uh, air traffic controllers sort of speak for drones. We call it USS, UAS service suppliers, aka traffic management companies, are going to combine all of their known drone locations together uh, so they can essentially have one big national map including all of the uh, uh, territory spaces in Guam, Puerto Rico, et cetera. So that's in the process of getting done. I just want to ensure you that, uh, and everyone else here that we're not sitting around on the UTM or any of these other technologies. Uh, we have a lot of people working on it uh, day and night. So, And we're making uh, pretty quick progress. It would be great for it to be quicker, but, uh, but a lot of progress is being made toward that end. Thanks. Right. And that's why it's education plays a key role in this, is educating people what counter U.S. technology is and what is the, uh, you know, uh, solution to everything is not shooting it down, <laughs> taking control of it, bringing it over. It's, uh, you know, the UTM system as such. A couple of states are working towards that goal. We ourselves have submitted our model of UTM uh, to FAA, which has uh, given us good feedback and good comments back. Uh, the reality is that, the, you know, we are... At one side is flying drones, and one side is uh, restricting the drones. We have to try and fill uh, that bridge between, which is UTM, and uh, uh, the companies are working with state and local government, with federal government, to make that a reality. And that's why the key thing to this is education. Uh, we need to take time to educate our folks uh, within the states, 
And it's not just, uh, you know, FA's responsibility, it's not the state's responsibility, it's also the industry's responsibility. When you sell your products, uh, educate them also uh, on how to use the products. It's an uh, important part of that. Okay, that is a good bit of advice on which to uh, end this panel. So I want to thank uh, Mark, uh, Darshan, and Margaret for sharing your views, and I uh, thank you very much for uh, coming out as well. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.